Uh, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to Christianity, the question is, are you the real thing? Are you the real thing or, or are you someone who, who embraces the mantra of or the label of being a Christian or the name of being a Christian, but, but are you the real thing? And I think that that's what is challenging for us today. That is what was challenging us last week. That's what's challenging us at this very moment. Is the faith that we profess, is the faith that we confess, is it something that we really believe? Is it something that is ratified on earth as well as ratified in heaven? And is it what God is claiming and naming in us to move forward in the life in which he's created? And I think that's a very important place uh, for us to start today. Part of the challenge of Christianity today is that we see the swinging of the pendulum. We're not really sure uh, what, what we think or what we believe anymore. There's that one swing of the pendulum that will go far in one direction, and I'm not saying right or left in the nomenclature that we think of right and left today, but I'm saying that in one direction the pendulum goes, we see God as a fiery, angry, divine being that is ready to smite us at the first rock wrong that we do, and that we have to be careful because the lightning bolts are gonna come from heaven. If, if we swing the pendulum to the other way, if we're not careful, it goes too far in the other direction where we merely wanna reduce Jesus as someone who's our friend who's gonna come over on Sunday and watch football and eat hot Cheetos with us. As we lose sight of his holiness, we lose sight that he is king of kings, that he is Lord of lords, that he went to the cross on our behalf. So we have to be careful how this pendulum of our faith continues to, to sway. You know, is God ready to destroy us or is Jesus merely a friend? And it's somewhere in the midst of that, we of the faith of Christianity, we who are born again, need to come to terms with what it is that we believe. And that's the, that's the important part of where I think we need to be going this morning. In the Old Testament, we learn that God was so holy that his people could not even say his name without being stricken dead. And if you ever look at the Old Testament text, you'll see that the name Yahweh has no uh, consonants or has no vowels in it. You were not allowed to say the name of God. And, and the God's name was not to be said because God is holy. When Moses went upon the mountain and God spoke to him, something happened to Moses. And the scripture tells us that Moses was changed. He was transformed. He had a, a glow about him. And, and that glow about coming in the presence of God was so powerful that when Moses Moses came down to see the people. He had to place a, a, um, a shroud upon his face for fear of scaring the people that he had been changed, that he had been transformed. Folks, we need to, in the 21st century, remind ourselves that, that what God said back in the days of the, of the writings of Leviticus are still true today when God said, I am holy, and because I am holy, I call you to be holy. And we are called to be a holy people in fact, he says here, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves to be holy because I am holy. It's an interesting word, consecrate. Consecrate yourself. What does that mean, to consecrate myself to be holy? It means that, that we must make a declaration, that we must make a stand towards something that is sacred. It means that, that we need to dedicate formally to the divine, to the uh, super religious, who God is, and, and that and for, his for his divine purpose, that God calls his children to be holy. And he, he, he says, don't be half, don't be a little bit, don't be a smidgen, but be holy, be all of you. Make all of you to be holy because I am holy. So if God calls us to be holy, what happened? If, if that's what God said is I call you to be holy, I call you to, to live in the midst of the holiness that I give to you, to honor him as our God and to honor one another as creations of God, what happened? Why is it that we have trouble today in understanding that? Well, you don't have to be a Christian to understand and see some of the interesting things going on in the world. I love the fact that uh, that uh, Pope Francis was here in our country this week. No, we're not Catholic, but, but like Catholic Christians, we're Methodist Christians, like Baptist Christians, like Pentecostal Christians, like Presbyterian Christians. We all believe in God. And I love what the, the man had to say when he basically was calling out that there is a situation and a concern in humanity that we need to begin to see and expect God moving in the world again. 
And he called us to do that. And I love, before the Pope even got here, that our politicians were wrangling amongst themselves and, and they were trying to say, how dare a holy man have anything to say about world affairs? How dare a holy man tell us about certain topics that are important to the life of the church? How dare a holy man come to our country and address our lawmakers and say these things? Folks, let me tell you, the church still has a voice, and the church needs to speak its voice, and we need to call people, we need to call the world into a place of peace. We need to call the world into a place of holiness, and in so doing, we need to not hide our voice in doing that, and we need to make sure that we're speaking so that all can hear you know, we live in a world now where, where now North Korea, is, his, their leader has said that they, they have now developed a long-range missile that they can launch to destroy portions of our country in an instant right now. We, we have lawmakers that are going back and forth and, and pundits that are talking about, you know, things that are happening in the world and, and we're wondering about what a nuclear Iran might look like. I mean, it doesn't take long to think about the world is in a crazy place. And especially when we are this close to destroying one another by the things that we make in the world. And God says, be holy, for I am holy. So the question is, what is wrong with humankind? If you have any idea of what the Bible says at all, if you even crack the pages, you will learn very quickly that God's original design of creation was the correct way. God said these words in Genesis 1. He said, I saw all that I had made, and I said that it is very what? Good. God says it was good. It was the result of an all-loving, all-expressing God who brought his genuine love that, and he bestowed that upon everything that was made. He, we can clearly discern from the beginning of the Bible that God made a beautiful world and that the world was intended to reflect God's purpose and the world was intended through creation to reflect God's beauty and God's glory. The world that we see today is not that kind of world. It's not. I mean, I don't know how often or how long we need to just keep avoiding the situation. We don't live in a world that demonstrates God's glory anymore. We are overwhelmed by our own glory. We are overwhelmed by our own pursuits. We are overwhelmed by our own desires. And God says, be holy as I am holy. The problem is what we call, it's a spiritual word, it's called depravity. Say that with me, depravity. Depravity means sin. And that's what it means, is that we are depraved, we are sinful, and we have to be careful that we never lose sight that our identity is marred. We can never lose sight that we are sinners. We must never lose sight of who we really are when we are in a room where no one else is looking. And when we do the kinds of things that we know are not part of being holy as God is holy, to one another and to others, we are depraved, we are sinful. God created us out of love, yes he did. God bestowed his love upon us, absolutely he did. But love is not all that there is to our true identity as humanity. While it is true that God plays a major part in our identity, it's also true that we have to be aware of the dangers of emphasizing only love when it comes to the kingdom's good. In a letter to Joseph Cownley, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he wrote this. He said, is it not most pleasing to me as well as to you to be always preaching of the love of God, but yet it would be utterly wrong and unscriptural to preach of nothing else? The bulk of our hearers must be purged before they are fed, else we only feed the disease. Beware of all honey. It is the best extreme, but it is an extreme. Wesley believed in the original righteousness of man. He expressed this belief using the words of Thomas Boston. He said this, with the same breath that God breathed into him a living soul, he breathed into him a righteous soul. So when God breathed life into us, he gave us a soul and then he breathed into us a righteous soul. This righteousness was the conformity of all the faculties and powers of his soul to the moral law. A belief in original righteousness is what gave Wesley his primary reason to afford understanding God's true love. 
Because Wesley said, because we were created with value, because we were created out of righteousness in God's eye, therefore God claims us. But God calls us to be holy as he is holy. Original righteousness also explains why people need to be saved. Why redemption is not one of many options, but redemption is the only option. That because we had original value upon creation, God redeems us. He reclaims us. He restores us. He reinserts us. He reconnects us. Whatever re dash word you want to use here, He places us in His midst. And He says, Because you have value. I'm not going to throw you away, but I claim you. But sin, sin strikes at the very essence of our human race. It does. Sin is not a subject that we sit around the dinner table talking about. So how did you sin today? We just don't do that. Or look at my journal. These are all the ways that I, that I sin today against God or someone else or even myself, and therefore I wanna hold myself in accountability. I would be willing to guess not many of us do that because sin is one of those things that we don't wanna talk about because heaven forbid if we talk about sin, then all of a sudden we wanna think that, that God doesn't love us or our church doesn't wanna talk about love. Wesley said to only talk about love, we gotta be careful because part of understanding love is that we're broken and we can understand the love of God better when we know our brokenness. And we know that we're depraved and we know that we don't make good decisions. So sin is something that occurs in relational terms. It's it's every voluntary breach of the law of love. And at its very base, sin is broken relationship, whether we break the relationship with God or whether we break the relationship with one another. Whether we break the relationship with God or whether we break the relationship with one another, that's called sin. And it's important to know that the breach of those relationships is conscious and willful. Folks, sin doesn't happen by accident. We don't just walk down the road and fall into sin. It is a willful and it is a mindful choice. We willingly, we knowingly, we willfully, and we choose to do it, okay? And that's where God says we've got to be careful with this because sin is what brings the brokenness of that. The result of sin is sickness. It's what mars our identity. And because of sin, humanity is sick unto death. The Bible doesn't say that we are sinners because we commit acts of sins. It says we commit acts of sins because we are sinners. If God's original design of Adam is the perfect design, which we believe it is, and that design was perfect before the fall, something happened. Adam at that time bore the image of God perfectly, completely, as God had intended it. But when the fall came, something happened. The image of God was radically changed. The relationship between humanity and God changed. The relationship between humanity and humanity changed. We no longer get along. We engage in harmful acts against each other because sin has entered into our life. Man was not able to come to God alone. In fact, man could not come to God at all after the fall. God chose to come to man. And it's by that wooing of his grace and reaching out that God demonstrates that in our brokenness, he desires to redeem us out of that brokenness out of that marred life into a new life with him. In our society today, some want to to deny that sin is in the world. Some want to just discount it. We use words like it was a mistake or or, "Ah, it was just a bad choice or, or, well, I wasn't really sure I did that. Do you, do you kind of catch on with that? And, and you know, we, we all have found ourselves, I think, in those instances where we've kind of discounted those things. And that is very harmful. It's even grown to a point where some of the most famous preachers that we see on TV never talk about sin. All they talk about is what will make you feel good in the eyes of God. So something's broken, something's wrong. 
Something has to come. Truth be known, we worship a God of love, but, but we must never forget that we who are unlovely are to be reminded of our presence before a holy God. Some try to explain philosophically. Don't sweat it, everybody does it. It's cool, don't worry about it. But we need a savior only if we need saving. We don't need a savior if we can save ourselves. Nothing in the faith that we confess says that we can save ourselves. It grows out of the awesome love and the awesome desire of God. But we have to understand when it comes to sin, everyone, everyone has been infected. Babies in wombs are infected by sin. Babies born into the world are infected by sin. Your holy grandmother has been infected by sin. We all, none of us can escape it. When Adam died to sin in the fall, we all died. We all find ourselves there. We can live an outwardly respectable life. We can go through the motions of attending a church service on Sunday. We can even find ourselves in a source group ministry or a Sunday class. We can feed the homeless. We can participate in worship, whatever all those things are. But what we must find out is that, that we must remember that just acting and going through the motions of living a life of Christ is not what Christ asks for. He does not ask for us to be a half-time Christian. He calls us to be all together in what we believe. This kind of sin runs deep and it runs silent. This kind of sin takes no holidays. It leaves no one immune. Genesis 6, 5 speaks of humanity's heart being continually set on evil in a more poetic way that someone said one time is, we do it because we're just bent on sinning. So what are the implications of this? The implications are, if sin were a thing, all of us would be at the doctor ready to have it cut off of our bodies. But it lives within us. It lives within us. And sometimes it cannot be seen. We cannot try hard enough. We cannot learn hard enough. We cannot worship hard enough. We cannot work hard enough to heal ourselves. Outside help from the Lord is what is the cure of the disease that we have. There was a man who went into the desert to live as a hermit, and the reason he went into the desert was he wanted to get away from everything in life, and he felt if he just went in the desert to live all by himself, he would have no one near him, and that therefore life would be pristine, life would be comfortable, life would be cushy, everything would be fine. He said, I could not run away from sin because it was in me, and everywhere I went, there it was, looking me straight in the eye. There was a woman who frantically went to an airline ticket counter and she placed several hundred dollar bills. She placed them on the counter and she said, here, use this. Send me anywhere that you can and back in three days because I cannot stand to live here another minute. This is what sin does to us. We eventually will see the problem, and when we see the problem, we're willing to do something about it, but we have to realize that sin is willful, sin is chosen, sin comes into our lives, we embrace it, we use it, we cast it against one another, we cast it against God, and we need to be aware of the way in which it will destroy us. Sin has several horrible effects. Here's just a few. Sin makes us dead toward God. Sin will make us dead Toward God. The fall of Adam brought the death of the soul. The irony of this soul death is that it, it gives a false sense of security and peace. John Wesley put it this way. He said, the poor unawakened sinner has no knowledge of himself. He knows not that he is a fallen spirit. Full of diseases as he is, he fancies himself in perfect health. Even more dangerous in this soul death is the very active state. Imagine spiritual death as, as a root, and out of that root uh, comes branches, and those branches that spring out of an evil root are unbelief and independence and pride and vanity and ambition and covetousness and lust and anger and envy and sorrow. And if the condition is left untreated, those things will consume us, and the image of God will not be seen. The second effect of sin is self-captivity. 
This is the logical consequence of what it means to be dead to God. If one is truly dead to God, then the only alternative is to turn inwardly. If I don't believe that there's a God, if I don't believe I need a Savior, then I'm gonna turn inwardly to myself and I'm gonna do everything in my power to save myself. But in the words of the good Dr. Phil McGraw, how's that working for you? Not very well, is it? Because we find out no matter how we try or what we do, we cannot overcome the curse of what has happened to humanity. We call it freedom. Well, it's a freedom. It's a right to choose. It's whatever we choose. We're saved by grace, right? So we can just be free to choose whatever we want. That's not at all what Paul meant. Paul meant that daily we must die of our sin. And moment by moment, we must embrace the love and the holiness of God. A third effect of sin is helplessness to change. Whereas the total image of God is not destroyed within us as sinners, it does render us powerless. When we, become, when we exercise our sin, it, it tends to revive us in a different way. We want to break loose from that, but we can't because we need a savior and we know that we cannot save ourselves. We strive through everything to break free of the curse, but we need to learn more. Peter writes this to a, a very flailing church in the first century. He says, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, which means don't keep living like you did before you were a believer. But just as we who called, who, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Peter says that we have to prepare our minds for action. Another translation of that means gird up your loins. Have you ever heard that phrase, gird up your loins? You know where that, from where that comes? It comes from the, uh, the, the Far East, or from the Middle East, is they would wear, wear long flowing gowns and they would find themselves in battle and they would be tripping over their garments because they were so long in both the arms and in the legs. And the only way that they could fight the battle before them, the only way they could defeat the enemy was to take the garment and bring it up and roll it up inside of the belt that they kept around their waist. And that's what it means to gird up one's loins, to free oneself, to free your limbs, to free yourself, to be able to fight the enemy enemy and to be able to win the battle that's before you. Peter also goes on and he says, prepare also your minds for action, gird up your loins, but he also says that we need to practice self-control. Another translation says remain sober, and anytime we hear the word sober, we think that someone is, is inebriated because of alcohol or drugs. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about how, how, how to have a clear mind. He says, keep a level head, remain steady in your mind. Focus on the things of God, not upon yourself. He says, don't let your mind wander. Don't let your mind drift because it'll cause you harm. Don't let your mind go into creating scenarios that may or may not exist that play games upon you. Maintain steadiness in what you believe, Peter says. What he's telling us is that it is a strenuous battle. It is a strenuous mental and spiritual battle before us, but that we must become ready to fight we must be ready to look the enemy in the eye, the enemy is sin, and say that sin will not reign in our life, that we will not choose to harm one another, that we will not choose to play games with each other, but that we will live a life that brings about the glory of God. There's a piece of scripture that challenges that, and I know that it, it, it makes us think twice about it, and, and that's found in the Lord's Prayer when the disciples said, Jesus, how are we supposed to pray? And he gives them the words of the Lord's Prayer and then he ends it by saying, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, meaning to God, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. But here's what sin does. Sin says it changes those words. For mine is the kingdom, mine is the power, mine is the glory. Each one of us knows that deep within us is a drive for affirmation. Not one of us in this room do not need affirmation, we all do. There are two innate needs that every human being has to love and to be loved. There's nothing wrong with, with affirmation. There's nothing wrong with, with, the, with the goodness that comes out of receiving the affirmation. 
And I believe that, that God gave us the ability to receive affirmation in a way then to take that in order so that we would be greater uh, harvesters for his vineyard into the world because our work is being affirmed that we are moving in the right direction. But what happens also often is recognition of the glory becomes our primary motivation. We stray from God's path and we step into a path of, of narcissism and pride. And what we learn along the path of holiness is that giving our entire life to God profits us nothing unless we give him our life and what? Our heart. That inside of here, inside of here is who we are. And therefore, we must surrender all these things to God. One of the famous um, uh, sayings of gamblers when they're in the big gambling matches and they take all the chips and they push them all to the center, they say, I'm all in. And they're ready to risk everything on the next turn of the card. What about us? As a people of faith, are we all in? Are we ready to risk everything that the world has to offer in order that we might receive the goodness of what God is giving to us. Let me stress something this morning. There is power to the powerless, there is help for the helpless, there is hope for the hopeless. There is a cure for the disease that we have learned about this morning. And in order to know about the cure, we must recognize the effects of the disease. Paul writes it this way. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, that Christ came into the world to what? To save sinners. No matter what else you walk away with today, no matter what else you walk away with today, I want you to take these three things with you. First, God is the one who always takes the initiative, and he's taking the initiative in your life. Secondly, God is the one who seeks you. Even when you and I don't seek him, he always seeks us, and he provides the healing medicine. We don't have the cure, he is the cure. Now some of you today might be saying, boy, pastor, you've really made me feel bad. Some of you are probably maybe thinking, I'm gonna go home today, and, and, and my pastor made me feel guilty. That's not what I'm trying to do. It's not at all what I'm trying to do. I want us to be reminded of the threat. I love you so much and I know you love me so much that we must always be reminded of the threat. Because once we know the threat, then we know how to go to battle. And once we go to battle, we know that we can win the war. And we can win the war because we dive into the holiness of God and the power and the strength of all of which he gives to us. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. My words today are not to tear you down. My words are to awaken you. My words are to awaken me. I've told you so many times, I never preach a message that I don't need myself because I'd be a hypocrite if I did. We're in this together. We need to understand the reality of our condition and only then can we deal with our sin.